All right, so it looks like uh, kind of participants have trickled in, and we're going to get started. So uh, kind of like I said a couple of minutes ago, my name is Nathan Puccini. I'm a marketing manager at Data Science Dojo, um, and we're just going to uh, jump right into introducing our presenter today, uh, and then uh, I'll hand it off to him. So today, uh, Ben Rogajan is going to be presenting. He's also known as the Seattle Data Guy. Uh, he has his own blog, Twitter handle. Uh, look him up. It's pretty easy to find. Uh, so Ben is a Seattle-based data scientist and engineer working in San Francisco, California. He has extensive experience designing ETL pipelines, databases, websites, and other software product products for stock <laughs> for startups and pre-established corporations. So uh, Ben, why don't you take it away with uh, your webinar on data storage systems? Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Nathan. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, like he, uh, Nathan kind of talked about, uh, my name is Ben Rogajan, and I work uh, mostly with like consulting for large and small companies to help them kind of automate a lot of their data workflows, uh, manage their big data, uh, and create analytics and models to help them, you know, gain insights and things of that nature. Kind of along that whole journey, one of the things I've run into, especially with companies that are new to data analytics and big data, um, you know, they, they might have applications, they might have uh, systems that have been running for years, and they've never actually worked uh, any form of analytics into it. So they, they often come to me, and, and one of the first things they'll come to is, is asking, you know, what kind of data systems they should be looking into. And so that's where kind of this talk is coming to, to play. Um, so if we, we just kind of start this conversation, kind of a general table of contents. Uh, I'd like to kind of start off with just some of the goals I'd like to get you guys uh, familiar with um, for today. Uh, next, I'd like to kind of talk about what you should consider as you're picking a data system. Um, and then we're kind of, kind of go over some of the big data systems I think about. Specifically, this is going to be a lot in the analytical realm. Like we'll talk about a few other uh, data storage systems, but this is going to be a lot in more of that analytical realm where things are more like data warehousey and things of that nature. And kind of even why uh, those different data warehouse systems kind of exist and, and what are the differences between that and something like a SQL Server. All right, so general goals today is to help provide an overview of all these data systems. There are just so many. I think that's one of the biggest things for me is like there are just so many. It's hard to keep track of. It's hard to keep track of the benefits. And it's really easy, I think, to get uh, caught up in the noise of all of, you know, oh, this is the cool new data system. Well, this is the cool new data system. Um, but I think it's really important to kind of look at it and be like, it might be cool and new, but is this the thing that I need, you know, from a cost perspective, from a maintenance perspective? and all that. Um, so yeah, so some part of this will just be also providing you some of the questions to ask before you kind of pick your system. So just some things you should think about when you're really looking into this. Um, so let's just kind of go into that. Um, and first to me is kind of generally the size of data. This one in particular came up because I had a client who maybe was having 500 rows a day coming into their application and they were looking at Redshift. And I, I honestly thought that was a little silly as a company that probably would have you know only tens of thousands of rows by the end of the year. Um, when you're paying for that, all the advantages of Redshift, it, it might not necessarily be worth it for you to you know, deal with it. And it's not, again, it's not just, and we'll talk about kind of Redshift, it's not just the, the payment, it's also the nuances and like technical expertise required. Next is kind of the type of queries you'll be running. Um, you know, how, how many analytical queries are you running? How big are they? Are they super complex queries? Are they really basic you know, counts and sums? Uh, are there, is there a lot of inserting, updating, merging, et cetera? You know, what types of queries is running on the system? Because that kind of changes uh, which system will be best later on. Uh, next, uh, that's very important to me is the developer skill set. And this is where I was talking about, you know, you really need to consider what skill sets your developer has because, or your development team has, because it's very easy to, you know, go to a conference and get very excited about, you know, the newest systems, um, the new, newest layers on top of systems, right? Like you've got so many companies out there that are developing layers on top of Hadoop or on top of DynamoDB. So you can get excited about these systems and then kind of force your developers into this, this square hole when they're a, pe you know, a round peg or something like that. And, and so really making sure you take stock of what your developers are good at and considering that before you go forward. And then finally, long-term goals. Um, so I like to, especially when I'm going to a new company, kind of draw out a general data roadmap for them, you know, for the next few years, just to say like, hey, what do you want to do with this data now? And what do you want to do with this data later? Because that also kind of changes it. You know, maybe you need a Redshift layer uh, for your analytics, but then that Redshift layer is going to actually push into like a RDS, which is like uh, AWS's or Amazon's uh, MySQL Postgres layer. 
And that's really about making sure you think that far ahead and, and not just jumping into, you know, developing something right away, but thinking, you know, well, how does this client need this five years from now? You know, what, what are their data goals? What are they going to try to answer? Not just, you know, today with this problem they're giving you, but what are they going to try to answer, you know, five years down the line and will this system manage it? So first I kind of want to just to cover some, some basic concept of, you know, why, you know, why different databases kind of exist. Uh, so the big thing to me is analytics versus transactions. There's a few other kind of uh, ideas as well. It's been recently added like streaming. So for those of you who know Kafka, that's kind of more of a streaming, streaming data system. But in this talk, we're really only going to be kind of focusing on uh, OLTP and OLAP, which stand for online transaction processing uh, versus online analytical processing. And these kind of perform two different specific functions uh, on the data. In the sense that typically with OLTP, that's kind of more like your uh, this picture on the left where you've got this update and insert. And a lot of that has to do with transactions. So you can think about this, you know, when you go to Amazon and you purchase an item, that gets put into a database as a transaction, as a line item that's, you know, person ID seven, bought product ID eight, you know, and, and something like that. It's just a new line added in. Um, and that only requires, you know, you to insert, you're just writing and it's, it's a single transaction. There's not a lot of complicated things happening. So a lot of stuff can happen at once. So you can have a hundred transactions often come into a database and it doesn't necessarily get bogged down. Um, in contrast with a lot of analytics, what you'll end up having is more like that on the right, where you're really taking entire swaths of data and summing all of this data in a single column. Um, and so that will often lock tables, especially if, you know, you've got lots and lots of uh, queries going on and you're, you know, you've got more of a traditional database that can only handle, you know, so many queries at one time and it's not distributed. So, so that's kind of how you think about it. You think about like one's kind of just inserting an entire record. So a new row, whereas OLAP tends to be a lot more of taking an entire column, summing it, maybe taking that sum and dividing it by another sum of another column. So it's a lot more column based work. And so that's what's kind of pushed a lot of design decisions for a lot of the databases we'll talk about, or where some, or where up until recently, a lot of databases have been more about the records and each row. You know, now we're kind of developing a lot that goes into more of, you know, columnar based uh, databases. And kind of with that talk, or with that point, you know, columnar based, I just want to bring up at least two kind of keywords uh, that I may use, which is one is wide column store. So why column store um, essentially means that no row, so if you think about a row in a typical database, has to look like another row in that same table. So typically, if you think like about MySQL, you'll generally have to have the same columns for every row. You know, you can't add a add-on column all of a sudden because you have a new value. Um, and it's very strict. You know, if you try to insert a row that doesn't exist, or sorry, in a row, a column that doesn't exist, you know, you've got a new column because you know, it's added from the application, the, the whole database will basically reject it, you know, your function will fail. And depending on how you built the rest of your ar architecture, you know, it could bring your entire system down. Whereas column wide store pretty much allows you just to insert data without a very specific schema often. Um, this is often also kind of looked at as key value. Uh, so this can be very JSON looking. It's not necessarily that it has to be key value, but often, you know, that's a good way of thinking it, where you don't necessarily need a defined data structure. All right, so let's kind of get on into kind of a little more of like the different types of data systems that exist, kind of based off of all this. All right, so I first kind of want to talk about MySQL versus Postgres or Postgres SQL, um, specifically because I think these have some similarities only in the sense that they're both open source. And I think they often uh, get talked about and they're often two that get uh, discussed a lot when it comes to especially developing an application. So an application that typically, again, deals with tons of uh, transactions, typically these two databases will actually do quite well. Um, and I like to say it's kind of like a popularity versus nuance. Uh, MySQL is very popular. You know, it's used by some of the largest companies and it's continued to use uh, by a lot of, a lot of the largest companies because, you know, if you set up good infrastructure, you can distribute it over, you know, multiple servers, uh, you know, replicate it, have master-slave situations go on and things of that nature. Whereas Postgres is very nuanced in the sense that it has a strong community, but it definitely has a lot of things that make it very unique. Um, for instance, it's considered an object uh, relationship database management system versus most typical other systems like MySQL, which is only a relationship database management system. So um, that kind of makes it 
different, but the difference is kind of slight in the sense that Postgres, the reason we reference it as object um, is because it takes some properties from object-oriented programming and implements them. So things like table inheritance, so it can, you can actually inherit uh, things from other tables, and then also overloading functions, which is you know, something you'd typically find more um, in object-oriented programming. So those, those are kind of like slight differences. Um, again, they're both kind of great for transactions, and they're both okay or pretty good when it comes to analytics when configured correctly. And I think that's kind of one of the hard things here is Postgres actually has a lot of interesting features, especially when it comes to geo data. So like, you know, latitude, longitude, things of that nature that make it very good when it comes to analytics, specifically around, you know, the globe when you're trying to like do map work. Um, it can get very nuanced in the sense I've seen people create calculations for making sure you ensure when you're doing distance calculations, uh, you're taking in, into account like the curvature of the earth. Or, or something of that nature. And it, it does kind of allow you to do that because it allows you to store specific geo uh, data points. Um, trying to think. Overall, and then just kind of the other thing that I usually think about uh, with MySQL versus Postgres SQL, in general, MySQL tends to be faster. I'm not gonna claim that specifically because I'm sure in some cases Postgres SQL is faster, but in general, MySQL has kind of a uh, general performance uh, advantage over uh, Postgres. So I think that's something some people like to think about. And I think that's one reason MySQL still kind of tends to be a, a heavily leaned upon source. Um, the only other point I'll mention is on these two is that MySQL is owned by Oracle. Um, so technically it is open source. But I, there are points where you will need to consider having, or you're not considered, you'll have to end up paying for it based on um, certain terms and services. Okay, so this is kind of like the two transactional systems I wanted to focus on. There's a boatload more, you know, you could look at Oracle, uh, SQL Server, um, things like that. But those are not free as they tend to have to be licensed, but those also do great work. Um, and the, the differences between these, these you know, few systems are, are slight. You know, they, they are all SQL compliant, um, various types of SQL, like for the longest time, and I'm actually not sure if MySQL has fixed this. Uh, MySQL wouldn't let you do analytic functions. They just hadn't had it implemented. Um, I haven't had to implement analytic functions in, my C in a newer version of MySQL recently, so I, I'd have to check to make sure if that's still, still the case. All right, with that, with all of that, uh, we're gonna kind of go into Redshift. And I think Redshift is kind of this first look into data warehousing um, specifically. So, so for those who don't know what data warehousing is, I'll kind of quickly go over it. It's just basically creating a data storage system that is one, very fast for analytics, and two, very easy to use for um, analysts. I think that's what I usually think about when I think about data warehouses, is they're very approachable. They're not very complex. They don't have, uh, like in a normal normalized database, they don't have uh, data that you've got to join 30 joins across you know, just to get some data field, it's usually some central data table that has dimensions around that data table. And so Redshift was really developed to manage this, because if you remember what I talked about with analytics, because again, this is kind of analytics focusing, one of the things that you really do a lot of is not row by row work, but you do a lot of columnar work. So it's a columnar storage system, which basically just means that unlike other, you know, systems that might store a record by a row, it stores that data on a column level. So this kind of gives it several advantages. Uh, in particular, when you end up storing data with Redshift, you can actually set up a compression or encoding, uh, and it depends on how you want to encode it. And so because that column is in one data type, you know, if you think about it, you know, your column could just be the, the money spent that day or miles driven or something of that nature. Because all that column is one data type, when compressing, it can get compressed uh, much more efficiently. And then similarly, when it's being read, the IO is much better because Again, you're, you're reading compressed data and you're, you're not having to deal with the same overhead of, of larger uh, uncolumnized data. And again, also because all of that data is stored together and you could really get uh, in deep on the architecture of Redshift, but all that data is kind of stored together, um, it just makes it easy to access in that single column. Uh, along with that, and I kind of skipped over this point, it's, it's built using uh, MPP, so massively parallel processing. So this is very similar to, we're, we're gonna talk about this too as well with, with Hadoop where there's this distribution concept, right? Um, 
and basically with Redshift, uh, it's similar to again Hadoop, where Hadoop has kind of this head node. Uh, Redshift has like a leader node, and then has a bunch of other uh, nodes that are going to be doing a lot of the work for you. You know, that leader will kind of break up that work and read it all for you, and that makes it much much faster. And so this is this is kind of that ability to process over a lot of parallel systems. Um, so this is this is taking advantage of not having to scale up vertically with you know just adding extra um, gigabytes of RAM, but instead you can just add more and more uh, nodes and break down that work farther uh, horizontally. Um, and so kind of along with that, as I'm, as I'm going with this, uh, the other kind of point with that is distribution, which is you need to figure out how you're going to distrib distribute for Redshift. Because um, in order to take advantage of that, you know, parallel processing, you have to make sure the data is distributed correctly in order to get uh, the full benefit. And that's where I usually say, you know, you need to have uh, developers that understand what they're doing, because unlike, you know, MySQL or something like that, that most likely all that data stored in, you know, one place for the most part, here, it's going to naturally distribute it. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can set distribution for Redshift. You can set it, set it where it's even. So that means basically if you set it even, it just breaks the data evenly. You know, you get one row, it puts it into node one, get row one row, you put it in node two, you get one row, you put it in node three, and you know, it just breaks it down that way. Um, and you don't necessarily get the full advantage um, in that case when, you know, if, you're, if you only need that data by date, right? Like if you're doing a lot of analytics and it's by date and you usually only need, you know, <clears throat> the most recent data or something like that, you might want it more broken down. Or maybe you want it monthly and, you know, over the last seven years, and if you're broken down by date, you know, it might be better broken down. So it's one of those things that's kind of important to think about uh, when you're setting up uh, your distribution. And that's usually distributed on what they call a key. And so that's kind of another nuanced thing with Redshift is it has something that is referenced as a key, but it is not the same as a key, like a primary key for the most part. Like it, it can act like one, but for the most part, it, it's not the same. Um, it acts almost more like an index uh, than it does a key. You know, I guess some keys are indexes, but in the, for the most part, it really is more of an index and not something like a primary key where you need just a unique thing. It's more about how do you set it up so that when it's distributed, it's distributed on that key. Um, so there's two specific keys. There's um, a compound key and an interleave it key. So the compound key is essentially, if you create it, the order you put the rows in is kind of the order of importance based off of that. So, you know, whatever's the most important recent thing to be sorting by, you, you pick that key first. Um, where the other one is just basically, uh, it's kind of even. And so these are kind of very nuanced things, I think, and it can be a little bit daunting at first for people who aren't accustomed to working in the system. And so that's why I often don't necessarily point people to Redshift unless they're really needing the benefit of that massive uh, parallel processing. You know, when you've got tons of data, that's Redshift's great because again, it has an ability to have petabytes of storage because if you need more storage, you just add more nodes. Um, and, that, and that's a huge advantage. But again, if you don't need it, if you really only need something that's, you know, in a hundred gigabyte range, you can probably stick with a classic data warehouse system, you know, SQL Server, Oracle, or something like that. Because there's no point in, in getting, you know, more expensive developer time if you could just avoid it by you know, using a simpler system that doesn't require the same uh, architecture. Uh, another kind of important note that I like to think about Redshift is it does allow for upsert, which for those who are familiar with like update insert in SQL Server or like kind of a merge statement, um, it basically allows you to both insert and update uh, new rows at the same time. And I think that's important kind of because we'll keep talking about some other systems that are only read write focused uh, where Redshift allows both. Um, so those are kind of, that's again, kind of a high level of Redshift. Again, there's, there's definitely a lot more uh, that you could go into, um, everything from architecture to, you know, how to use it and how to query on it. But um, I just kind of want to give you this overview for this. All right, so for this one, I kind of cram them all together, um, only because I think they often get uh, crammed all together mentally for most people one way or another um, in the sense that Hadoop, HDFS, and HBase can easily kind of in people's minds mentally feel like the same thing depending on the company you work at because if you work at certain companies you might be working off of like a Presto layer or something like that and feel like well we're working on HDFS um, 
an HDFS that has a dupe or HBase on top of it that has, you know, a Presto layer or a Hive layer. And, you know, it can feel like it's all the same thing, but each of these kind of components uh, play a different role or are a different thing altogether. Hadoop, for instance, I mean, let's just start there because that's kind of the, the overlying system it is just an open source, you know, scalable fault tolerant framework, really. That's, again, for most people who have used it, is written in Java. Um, so it's really, again, another distributed system that you can have kind of a head node and, and it processes everything over you know, multiple systems. And that's consisted, or that system is built up of three kind of consistent components or three different um, components. Um, the HDFS layer, which is more of that storage layer, so it's that file system. Uh, MapReduce, which is the processing layer. So one, again, HDFS is kind of just the storage layer. Then on top of that, you put MapReduce, which processes all that data. So when you're calling it back, it can process it all. And then Yarn, which is more just purely for resource management. Um, so yeah, so th that's kind of just Hadoop. It's more of just that framework of things that you can end up building something off, to, off of. Uh, where on top of that, we have HDFS, which is just a distributed file system. That's really what it is. You know, it, it's that similar concept where Redshift has multiple uh, nodes that you can store data on. Similarly here, you know, HDFS can store on multiple uh, nodes all of these files that you're, you're putting into. But that's not really uh, friendly for most people. Uh, most people aren't good at writing things like MapReduce jobs or dealing with yarn. And so that's a lot of work and a lot of uh, development costs. So instead, what people will often do is put HBase, which is more of a columnar data database on top of HDFS. And that, that makes it a little bit more accessible. But just to kind of go one step further, we'll then add a SQL layer um, on top of that. And that will often be something like Presto or Hive. And so I think this is where most people are comfortable working with these systems. Um, you know, they might say they work with Hadoop, but if they're working with Presto and Hive, it really just feels like SQL Server or something, or Oracle or MySQL, because you, you, you aren't seeing all this complicated um, architecture underneath where you're having to write MapReduce jobs, where you're having to, you know, set up table structures in HBase. And all of that kind of adds more and more complication. And this is why I don't, like, if you don't have a team of uh, software engineers often, is what I'd recommend. Um, Hadoop is not always the best option, uh, at least not by its own. You can get something like Hortonworks or something to sit on top of this altogether, um, but on your own, it will definitely be, uh, it will not be the easiest thing to manage if you're, if you're just trying to implement it into your system. Because there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it that um, isn't SQL based, and so for data people, this can be hard to approach. Um, that's that's the point here. All right, so we're going to kind of go um, kind of more to a third party uh, in the sense that this data, both Redshift and Hadoop, uh, kind of are just as on their own their own database system. Well, not Hadoop, sorry, HBase and, and Presto with this and Hive on top of it are kind of their own data storage systems. Um, but I think the next one I'm going to talk about is interesting only because of how it's decided to move forward and how it's designed. So for those of you who've heard of Snowflake, um, or for those of you who haven't, I think it's definitely one of the better marketed uh, tools out there in the sense that um, they've got talks all over um, everywhere. Um, they try to explain the reasons and benefits of Snowflake. And it, it's definitely a very interesting system because it's what they call kind of the first only or cloud only data warehouse. Basically, what Snowflake does is it splits storage and compute. So it essentially puts your storage into something like S3, and it, it also sits on Azure, so the equivalent on Azure. But it can put basically all your data in S3 in what they reference as micro partitions. And then all of that is um, only processed when you need it. And it's processed typically using an EC2 layer that they've, again, they've kind of set up. And so when you pay for this, you, you kind of, it kind of automatically just sets itself up, and you can treat it very similar to any other uh, database system. Um, it kind of just attempts to, like when data is loaded into Snowflake, reorganize the data into its internally optimized compressed version on its own um, and into its own columnar format. Again, this, you'll, you'll see this kind of over and over again where data warehouses were built with the columnar format uh, mindset because again, that, that's optimal for data warehouses. You know, it's not really optimal when you're trying to do transactions if all your data is stored on a column level and then you've got to put all those columns back together before running an update statement. Um, but it's really, really good for things like data warehouses where you're really just trying to do analytics and you're trying to, you know, 
analyze chunks of data at one time, you know, whole column at one time. Um, and really, again, Snowflake is kind of this managed system where it really understands how to manage all of this uh, on its own for the most part, from like size to structure to compression. If you remember, I mentioned with Redshift, you kind of have to choose the compression, whereas really Snowflake tries to take care of all of this for you uh, as much as it can. It's really, another way you can think about it is, is a very, one, it's got the smart portion of it where it tries to care, take care of everything on its own, but it's also kind of a virtual warehouse, so to say, in the sense that it really doesn't have that uh, hard structure that something like Redshift has or um, you know, SQL Server might have. It's kind of just existing in these micro partitions, and then you've got this uh, processing layer on top, um, and then you can access it, access it with SQL um, or other methods as well. One of the downsides, again, it has a ton of upsides, but because it's third party, I think third parties are always kind of hard to manage, uh, only because they're often, um, there's a lot of configuration required, there's a lot of nuance that you know made sense to developers that developed it, that won't necessarily make sense to a developer who's never seen it before, at least not right away. So there's not that many uh, developers with the skill set to handle Snowflake. You know, it is kind of a plug and play data warehouse, but it still requires configuration and setup. So you're going to probably end up needing to either get a developer to uh, go to some class to understand Snowflake better, or you're probably gonna end up paying some, someone from Snowflake to help you set it up. And so it can definitely have those hidden costs in there. And, and that's one of those things, again, I, I try to talk with, um, you know, uh, clients uh, before they, you know, jump into something. Because again, Snowflake is great. Uh, I think it's proven its performance, you can probably look it up, uh, to be superior to a lot of other data storage systems, but it also, again, comes at, at, at other costs where you're gonna be paying um, a lot more. And then just kind of round off uh, this whole talk, because I, I just wanted to kind of give you a general overview. Um, there's, there's tons of data storage systems, I honestly, um, don't think I could keep track of all of them. Um, so I just kind of wanted to go in and talk about a few, few, few more. So for those who don't know, uh, MongoDB I think is interesting. MongoDB to me kind of fits in the whole stack with um, kind of with the whole stack of this single JavaScript oriented uh, JavaScript oriented stack in the sense that, you know, you've got um, React, you've got Node.js, and then a lot of people I think like MongoDB because it's, it's not, it's called JSON-like, but I think it's BSON, which is like binary JSON. Um, and it allows you to store data kind of without a specific architecture. You can just kind of store documents is the way you can look at it, um, rather than storing things with specific uh, predestined architecture. There's a lot you can do to like add extra columns um, when you're thinking about different document types. And so MongoDB is kind of this a little more free form and allows really easy again for especially developers who might not understand databases and might not want to go through the process of having to set up things like foreign keys or things like that to set up somewhere where data can get stored really easily um, without having to think too deeply about uh, overall data architecture. So NeoJ4 um, is another interesting kind of uh, Database system, because what it is, is what we call a graph database. So essentially, it consists itself of nodes that are kind of like entities in that graph, and it can kind of hold some sort of uh, attributes, um, kind of this key value pair in that node, and then those nodes can basically have what are called relationships. So you might have, you know, person A tied to company B. Well, that's, that's the relationship, right? Like you've got person A tied to company B. Um, and so it's, it's got some similar similarities between you know an RDBF, RDBMS, but it's definitely kind of its own thing. And, and it's also very, what they call NoSQL, which is not only SQL, um, but it's still uh, what we call ACID compliant, which I'm not gonna go into ACID compliant because I'm gonna be going into more of a database talk, but it basically has this consistency. Um, so next I'm gonna talk a little bit about Cassandra. So Cassandra, is kind of that wide column store uh, database. It, it's got some similarities with DynamoDB, um, some similarities. It, it offers that key value pair and like, again, um, data system that has kind of this fluctuating column. You don't have to have very specified columns um, and it's a little more uh, distributed as well. 
And then CouchDB is, is, has some similarities to MongoDB, except for it is purely JSON, um, which can provide advantages because it's technically faster. Uh, so those are, those are kind of the databases I wanted to just bring up to you. you know, I wanted to like, let you have a general understanding of what all these systems are, kind of maybe why you'd want to use them, what are some advantages. Again, a lot of this is focused on analytics, but I wanted to make sure people kind of had a broad understanding. Um, so if I keep going, I think afterwards, okay, so then just kind of a conclusion, uh, just as a terrible rhyme, I, I put, you know, don't pick a tool because it's cool. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, pretty cool databases out there and data storage systems. Again, like Hadoop, I think has a lot of advantages. Uh, Redshift has its own advantages, but they can be a, um, a monster to basically manage. And sometimes it's just better to pick something that uh, is easy to manage and you can also find developers on. I think that's another thing is sometimes it's difficult to find developers who, who might have a skill set. So if you want to find developers that manage Hadoop, that'll probably be possible. And it'll probably be upwards of $150,000 a year for you to hire that kind of an engineer. Um, so you got you really got to think about that. And you got to think about also your end user, especially when you're developing all these systems, especially if you're developing these systems for analytics, you can't be developing it in something that's very um, esoteric and very specific to certain people. Like only some people know, write, know how to write MapReduce jobs, so now no one can get analytics data from your Hadoop system. Um, there's no point in providing a data warehouse if no one can access it. And so it's really, it really is about making sure you think about, you know, who's your end user? Um, how are they gonna access this data? Is it overly complicated because you wanted to get something that was better performance? Because again, even if it's got better performance, if no one can access it, it doesn't really matter. And then finally, I already said this, but think about your developers, which is just basically, you know, look at your developer's skill set and say, hey, can they build a system on this? Can they not? So I, I hope that was all helpful. Kind of a good overview. I, I did, I'm not trying to go specific into anything. You know, if you've got specific questions, I think we'll have time for Q&A now. Um, but also just in general, you know, these are, I think, great points for you to start researching and, and looking into these specific topics. All right. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions, there's a Q&A button you can click and uh, type your question in there. You could also post it in chat. Um, so we'll just kind of hang out here for a couple of minutes and see if anybody has any questions for you, Ben. Uh, what's the best way to build skills? Hmm. That's, that's definitely hard. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good way to answer this. Because I have not tried to build specific skills there. I've, I've usually only done it when I've like come to a client and then had to, you know, work with their Snowflake DB um, or set it up for them. And in that way, you know, then you're just stuck looking through documentation and Googling it and you've got the stress of, you know, putting up something for a client. Um, and so that's usually the best way I've found to do it, you know, um, and then someone else is paying for it. But I'm, I'm more than certain that Snowflake, because Snowflake uh, does a pretty good job at what I like to say is marketing. Uh, you could probably look into, um, I'm sure they've either got going to have YouTube videos to help you do it or, or document. Well, they had good documentation. That was the one thing that I had. But I'm sure they also have YouTube videos just because, again, they, they, they want people to be able to understand it. And so that would be where I'd look first. Sorry that that one's a little bit less specific. Okay, Ben, one just came through chat. How, how do you compare their popularity? How do I compare their popularity? I think um, some of that you can, uh, like some people do very specific things. Um, like I'm actually now curious about this, but some people do very specific things where they go on like GitHub and they'll like count the number of files written in different languages or, or for different systems. Um, for me, it's mostly through anecdote um, in the sense that like how many companies have I worked with that use MySQL, how many companies have I worked with that use, you know, other ones. And, and that's generally how I've kind of found popularity. I also find it through like, when you go through conferences, like Postgres has its kind of own conference. And I think a lot of that is inherent because of the fact that it is such a niche culture. Um, like the people that go there, like they really love Postgres and they really generally believe that it is arguably the best data system out there. Um, but it is kind of a niche environment and I don't think there's, um, and there's definitely not as much documentation. And I think that's the other way I, I usually figure it out is like, how good is the documentation? And if I Google a question, how long does it take me to find an answer? Um, so those are the ways I, I usually determine popularity, but my, my sequel is like popular because even, you know, you can look it up, but like Facebook is still built on it. Um, like there's large systems that are still built on things like that. Um, Oracle is what I consider a, uh, like a hidden popular 
uh, database because a lot of people don't realize how popular it is only because it basically backs almost all the infrastructure that no one talks about, you know, tra uh, transactions for banking and things like that, um, where a lot of these things are kind of hidden. Um, but if you kind of understand how general it is, like pretty much any ERP system written before probably 2000 or was written on Oracle, um, if not even probably 2008. It was written on Oracle because that was just what people did. And so that, that's, I mean, that's generally how I judge popularity. Um, some of it's anecdotes, some of it's just, you know, based on what you see. All right. If, uh, oh, oh any there's success one. stories of companies that were outdated reporting system, no internal survey management, shifted to some newer technologies. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I've definitely, I've definitely had that personally um, happen a lot. And, and there's a couple different ways this happens. You know, you've got, uh, the one, one where it's just like you're basically convincing companies to go from on-premise databases to off-premise um, to something like AWS. And what you'll generally see is, you know, they'll, they'll end up reducing their cost because one, they, they get rid of their server. And so that's usually one big thing that, you know, you'll make people happy with is, you know, they'll say like, look, you don't need a, you know, you don't need to pay your system admin as much anymore, or you, you know, you need the less uh, talented system admin because it's just run off of AWS. So that's one kind of thing that I've usually had uh, success with. Uh, the other thing is like you're usually paying less for in the sense of how uh, the fact that the databases and server in general is only you're only paying for it when, when you're using it. And so those are kind of like the key things that I've had uh, in order to shift someone over and the, the key accomplishments I'll usually tell or, or kind of show back to them. Um, I've definitely done that with one company where like they had their whole basically system on Oracle. Um, and we ended up, uh, and it was on premise and we shifted them. Um, one, we got them off of Oracle because Oracle is very expensive. And two, we ended up shifting them onto a cloud uh, RDS, which for those who don't know, RDS is just really, um, you can spin up anything from MySQL to SQL Server on AWS. And it is much, it's generally much cheaper than having something on premise. Do any of these data system options have limitations in terms of compatibility with BI tools? Um, let me think specifically. I know pretty much all of these uh, systems pretty much should work with what, I don't know about OBIE, I know, cause that one's specifically um, Oracle. So I'm now curious if like Oracle only lets you connect with Oracle products. I'm sure they let you do SQL Server, but I'm not so sure about modern things, but things like with Tableau, I know Tableau has a Redshift and Presto uh, operator and Snowflake operator as well. Um, pretty much any of those companies are very inclined to connect with other third party systems like Tableau. Um, I'm trying to think about anything more modern, like uh, Hadoop and, and Presto have, and well, Presto is the layer on top, and Hive have kind of been around enough that they've, I think they're pretty well connected to. I'm trying to think of anything that's missing. If anything, like I would say maybe Snowflake has some some holes, but that would be the one one place I could see somewhere being being a gap, just because Snowflake's kind of the newest of everything, and they're they're their own company, so they, they don't have as much, um, like open source that you would usually have with like a dude. But nothing in particular that comes off my mind. Appreciate your tips for layman on how to start to learn about big data and big data platform. I mean, the best way in general, so, oh, sorry, let me just, like I, I always do this, I mumble. So I'm reading um, the question, appreciate your tips for layman of big data on how to start to learn about big data and the big data platform. So specifically learning how to like work in big data. I, I mean, the big thing is you need big data to kind of learn about big data. And so that's generally, you know, going and taking a, a role in a company that offers you that opportunity. And so that means, you know, finding or looking for roles that, you know, work with Redshift, that work with Hadoop, that work with um, uh, just space, you know, for some reason, Hadoop, Redshift. Um, but yeah, basically finding, finding those roles. And I think obviously the hard thing there is then how do you get hired in those roles? And usually the goal is, you know, hopefully get an internship with one of those companies. Um, if not try to find a junior dev job. Um, but it, it's, it's going to be really hard otherwise, because I think the thing I've usually run into when trying to develop those skills on like, you know, your own personal PC is you know you're you're really limited in the sense you're never going to run into big data problems you're you don't have enough data or if you want to have that much data it's going to cost you a lot because you're going to be running it on some sort of aws instance and then do you want to pay a thousand dollars a month just so you can learn something 
And so you really want to try to find a company that you can learn that at, if possible. I think that's, that's arguably the best way. Um, obviously, there's certifications. Um, I, I kind of go both ways with certifications. Like sometimes I need that little bit of help just to kind of understand some small concept. And, and so I feel like getting a certification or taking a class somewhere is helpful. But I also sometimes fall in, in the trap of like, yeah, but they never helped me as much as I wish they would. And I am always going to learn more by, by doing it myself. So, so that's kind of where it's like, you, you really want to find opportunities in companies. And, and I'm also pointing out that you should find an opportunity in a company because like, it's very easy to go work for a large company and never get an opportunity to work in those systems. So you want to make sure that the role you're going into is a role that teaches you the skills you want. Um, so it's important you figure that out first um, because you might be going to a company that might be a big tech company and you might, again, be at that layer where you're not having to think about the big data portion, even though that's what you want to do. You know, you might be at that Presto layer where, you know, you're not thinking big data, you're just kind of writing queries, um, which you could write, you know, anywhere. So I think, I think it's an important point to, to put out is that make sure wherever you're going, if big data is what you want, if there's a certain system you want, you know, try, try to find it. Because um, that's always going to be the easiest way. All right. If that's all the questions, I think we can wrap it up. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, let me know if you, you know, if you have any questions, you know, you can look me up at the Seattle Data Guy. Um, I'm on Twitter and I, I, and I write some posts on Medium. So occasionally you'll see me and I, you know, questions often help me write posts. So thank you all.